We'll see how this goes. Maybe it just is like feeling sensitive about being um, close, to, close to the other microphone. It's somehow feeling a little bit, uh, you know, intimidated by its competition. So hopefully it's going to like sort of step up and continue to broadcast. Okay. Um, so a stochastic gradient, where you will make, will probably pass through the data multiple times. Um, each time you pass through the data, um, it has to be in a randomized order, okay? So if you ordered all the examples, um, let's say all the positive examples first and all the negative examples after that, you would get a terrible result, all right? So it only really works, the math only works if you're choosing an example at random each time. And what we usually do to approximate that is one of two things, depending on how much data we have and what your kind of personality profile is, I guess. Um, option one is you take the whole data set and you just randomly shuffle it once. So just generate some sort of random key and shuffle it, sort it by those keys, and then stream through it that, that shuffle thing many times. All right. Um, what's a little bit better is to um, stream through it, shuffle it, stream through it once, shuffle it again, stream through it again, shuffle it again, stream through it again. So if you have a really good implementation of stochastic gradient descent, you'll spend more time shuffling than you will learning. Um, so that's, that's one of the, the things to think about. Um, but um, uh, each one of the passes through the data is called an epoch. At each point, we hold the model in, in memory and also usually one example, a mini batch, B examples. All right? And we're going to update the model with a gradient step. All right? So this is the basic algorithm. This is what's used for you know, I would say 95% of the deep learning experiments. And we're going to talk about doing this for, um, for a logistic regression. All right, so just to motivate logistic regression. How many people have seen logistic regression? Cool. All right. So it's basically the same um, form for a classifier as Rokio. So in Rokio, we're looking at the argmax of these um, things, uh, the inner product of, of a representation for the document and a representation for the class. Um, if we just have two classes, positive and negative, which is what I'm going to do for this assignment, just to kind of keep things simple, um, then uh, you could say, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the sign of the inner product with the document and the positive one class versus the negative one class. All right, so my class is a positive one and negative one, right? Or if I do a little bit of simplification, it could actually be just the sign of this quantity here which is just the difference of two vectors. So it could just be the sign of an inner product between x and a weight vector, OK? So, um, so in this format, Rokio would look kind of like this, all right? At the end of the day, we're, we're taking this, this dot product and we're thresholding with a sign function, OK? The sign function is just negative 1 for everything below 0 and positive 1 for everything else. Um, and um, uh, that's... Um, uh, this is the mapping, right? So x is now just my document vector, whatever my representation of the document, TF, IDF weights, or what have you. Um, the weights are basically the difference between, you know, what Rokia would give you as the weights for the positive class versus the weights for the negative class. Um, unfortunately, we can't differentiate the sine function, all right? So just trying to use, you know, the sine of x dot w is kind of a mess. Um, so what we usually do is we take some soft approximation to that, right? So we take some differentiable function that looks a little bit like this. Um, uh, one common choice is the logistic function, which the math looks like this. Um, and the function itself looks like this, right? So it's, a, it's like a step function. It's like a sine function. Um, it actually it ranges between 0 and 1 instead of minus 1 and plus 1, but that's not a big deal. Um, uh, and, and this is basically a motivation for um, uh, choosing this functional form. It's the same functional form we use for Rokio. Actually, it turns out you can pretty easily show it's also the same functional form you use for naive Bayes with two classes. All right. So all these things are basically linear classifiers. Um, and the only thing we're doing here is a linear classifier with a logistic so we can kind of uh, have a smooth uh, gradient. All right. So I'm just going to step through the math for this. Um, this is the math I stole from Charles Elkin, who's at, uh, 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 I believe, UC San Diego, um, or was for a while. I think he might actually be at Amazon or someplace now. But, um, so uh, this is, uh, this is, this is uh, sort of his formulation of it. Um, so we're going to learn a parameter of the classifier. The classifier looks like this. So the probability that y equals 1, which 
to be y equals 1, given that we've got x and our weight vectors w is just this quantity, right? Dot product of x and w um, run through the logistic function. OK. So um, if I have a single example, right? So I've got an example where I've got some particular x and some particular w, uh, and the y is either 0 or 1, um, then this basically works out to be one of these two cases. So the probability of the data that we've seen is either this, if it's a positive example, or this, if it's a negative example. OK? So in this case, I'm sort of trying to get something that's close to 1. Uh, in this case, I'm trying to get something that's close to 0. All right? And we're going to do this in log space because it, it looks nicer. It works out much nicer. Um, so we really want to look at the log of these numbers. All right? So what we're trying to maximize here is the log probability of this one example. All right, I've got x, y, and I've got my weights. And I'm writing it down this way. So it's log of p if y is 1, log of 1 minus p if y is 0. OK, and then p is just you know, the, the score with the logistic function. All right, And just to remind you, this x dot w, it's just this, this sum of the product of the corresponding components of x and w. All right, so um, uh, that's. That's, uh, that's what we've got, all right? So, um, so this is my prediction, all right? This is what my classifier does. This is my loss function, all right? And now I want to maximize that. So what I want to do is I'm going to do gradient um, descent. Um, or I guess in this case, it's gradient ascent, because I'm trying to maximize the, um, the log probability. Um, I always get these backwards, but you know, it's sort of the same. Um, so we can just, we can just like um, work this out. So I'm just, I'll just kind of keep doing it by cases. So um, uh, we know the formula for log of f is just 1 over f df. OK. So, so we can figure out what the, the first step of the derivation is here. OK. Um, and um, now I've got this thing, which I will need to find a partial um, with respect to the prediction p for every weight. Now, so I'm doing this for like some particular component of the weight vector, OK? So j is the jth component of the weight vector. It's the weight for the jth parameter, the jth word. Questions? OK. Um, so, um, so let's figure out what this guy is here, all right? We want to figure out what this derivative is. We want to di differentiate p with respect to that weight. Um, so um, it's a lot of math, but there's nothing you guys don't know. Right? Um, so we're looking at the derivative of this function. All right? Um, so uh, let's kind of step through that. Um, uh, we basically have uh, uh, a plus 1, which doesn't really matter. We've got um, this guy taken to the minus 1. So just using our kind of normal polynomial rule, we put minus 1 up to the front. Right? Then we take, the, we take this quantity, this, this function that we had before. Um, and you know the minus one turns into a minus two, right? And then we have this. Um, we now have to differentiate this guy right here, which is e to the dot minus dot product. Okay. And again, we know what the um, derivative of e to the f is, right? It's e to the f df, right? So we'll just use the chain rule right here. Okay. So we have this quantity here, which is e to the f and df. All right. Okay. And you know, finally, we're differentiating with respect to wj, right? And all we've got left here is we've got this sum of, of all the j's of xj, wj, right, with a minus sign in front. So all that's left is the, is the minus xj, all right? So, so this is what we end up with after I multiply everything out, all right? So that is what the, what the derivative is. Um, it looks kind of like a mess. Um, or it looks at least like it's something big and complicated. Uh, it's not as bad as we think. So this part right here is actually my prediction, p. OK? So that's actually something familiar. It's a quantity I've already computed, p, the prediction. So this is just the predicted value for x. Um, uh, so this one actually is also something that uh, turns out to be something I can simplify if simplifying means I can use you know, quantities like p, right? So 1 minus p um, uh, 
I could write like this, right? So p is this, right? 1 minus p would be this. If I just, this is one way of, uh, another way of writing 1. And I can combine the things on the bottom and the things on the top, so the ones cancel, and I basically have e to the x dot w over 1 plus e to the x dot w. So this is 1 minus p, and, and that's, that's also down here, right? This is 1 minus p right here, OK? So, so this thing got kind of complicated, but after we've, we simplify it, there's actually a, a kind of simple form. So the derivative is p times 1 minus p times x to the j, right? So, um, so that's this step right here. That's the derivative of p. Okay, with respect to one parameter xj. All right. So this is all just a subtask, right? If you recall, I was like here, right? I needed to like figure out what this partial derivative was so I could finish my, my derivative for the full loss function. So let's go ahead and plug that in, okay? So um, I know what this thing is now. It's p times 1 minus p, okay? So um, then I end up with this, 1 over p times p times 1 minus p xj, right? Um, which, again, I can simplify. Uh, those 1 over p's cancel. And then I've got this thing, all right, which, again, I can simplify a little bit. And this turns out to be negative p times xj, all right? So these are basically the two cases. So in the case where y is 1, the derivative of the, of the probability of that example, the log probability of that example, um, with respect to that example, is just basically 1 minus p times x to the j, right? Um, and um, uh, if it's 0, if it's a negative example, it's p times x to the j. And this this kind of makes sense, right? So if, if x to j basically sort of indicating the presence of a word, then if the word is there, right, and um, uh, the, um, the class is positive, okay, then probably you should be thinking about raising the weight if you may got it wrong, okay? So if, uh, if p is much smaller than 1, right, then this says there's a positive um, partial derivative. So you should be raising the weight for wj, right? Um, I'd like to just stop for a second and check for updates here. I try and schedule these things carefully. Um, OK. Um, and then, then again, if, 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 uh, if, if, if you, let's say you predicted um, um, a high score, right? So your p was very large, right? But really, the right answer was 0, right? Then what we're seeing here is we, we, would, be, we would be lowering um, the value, the weight for that um, word j, xj, all right? So that kind of makes sense. And of course, if um, that word isn't present in the example at all, so the jth component of your document is 0, right? then what we should have is we should have a, um, uh, I'm kind of feeling sad because I've just, um, you can't see it, but on my thing there's a little spinning thing here, so I'm not sure what's going to happen. Yeah, it's not working. You guys look at this for a second and think about it carefully. I'm going to try and rest control um, uh, away from, uh, My, uh, I'm going to try and rest control back. It's not easy to do because I'm also in split mode. Let's first start by turning mirroring on. Oh, that's much better. All right. This is this is just this is just dork now. Um, oh, well, let's do this one then. Oh, I'm not responding. Quit. All right. 
right. Uh, there's a recovered file. That's nice to know. I didn't change anything. So this is around where we were, I think. All right. So I've got these two cases. They kind of make sense. And we can actually combine these, right? So in either case, um, this, uh, I, can, I can write this expression down as y minus p. OK, so that evaluates to 1 minus p if y is 1, and you know, minus p if y is 0. OK, so this is, at the end of the day, a very simple form of the gradient. So um, this is basically my error, how far off my prediction was, right? And then I'm multiplying it by the value of that, um, that feature. Um, and if we want to write this as a vector, right? So this is the gradient with respect to one particular parameter, the j parameter. Um, uh, but if I want to write it as a vector, I could write it like this. So this is the update we're going to do um, uh, after I've seen the teeth example. I'm going to basically um, add some um, quantity. Um, so this is making this the x vector will make this will vectorize this whole thing, okay? And um, I want to move some some step in the direction of the gradient. So the distance I want to move the learning rate is this parameter lambda, okay? So that's the function. That's the, that's the algorithm at the end of the day in MATLAB. OK, and now we're going to like talk about how to ramp that up and make it efficient. Um, but just to review, we start with a Rokio-like linear classifier. OK, we replace the sign with something differentiable. OK, and you know, sneakily in there, I, I change the scale. Um, and then I write down my loss function, OK, um, and differentiate. Um, and I end up with something very simple and elegant, OK? So the update for the gradient is just this little quantity. OK, so this has a really nice property um, if you care about doing things at scale for large amounts of data. So let's imagine, for example, let's zip ahead to the far future. Let's say um, this weekend when you guys are working on implementing this to classify you know, all the documents in Wikipedia. OK. So whenever you're classified, so there's you know, tens of thousands, how many hundreds of thousands of words in Wikipedia. Um, so when we do an update, um, uh, this looks like an expensive thing because it looks like we're updating the whole vector of parameters, right? So on, the weights for hundreds of thousands of words have to be changed every time we look at a single example, all right? But it's not that bad because your example is a sparse vector, okay? Your example is encoded, let's say, as just you know, the set of terms that are present in that example, or maybe term frequencies. So all the terms that aren't present, the components are going to be 0. right? So the components that are 0, you never have to update. Okay? So this uh, is an update, but it's an update on, on sparse vectors. Okay? So this is a key point. Okay? So if the jth component is 0, then the gradient of that component to zero. So when you're processing an example, you only need to update weights for the non-zero features of the example. Right? So for documents, you're only updating weights for the words that are in the document. All right? That's the same thing that's true for naive Bayes and Rokio, right? but we really want that to be true. Right? If that's not true, uh, things, things are, are much more expensive. Okay. So here's what the algorithm would look like. All right? So uh, I'm going to assume that we're just reading in documents, so each example is in the kind of usual format. So we've got a class name, and um, then we've got a list of words that appear in that document. All right, so we're going to go through each example, right? Uh, and actually, we're going to do this multiple times. So we're going to make t passes over the whole data set. Um, and then in each one of those passes, I'm going to go through each example in some random order. Um, and first, I'll compute the prediction, because that's part of my update. Right, I have to figure out what the prediction is. So the prediction is this. Okay. Um, so so notice the way I've written this. Um, I'm not just doing dot just to emphasize this. I'm 
I'm actually, um, what I'm doing is I'm summing over the um, cases, the j's where x sub j is greater than zero. So these are the non-zero cases, right? I guess really should be different from zero, but uh, these are one of the non-zero uh, cases. And we're looking at the product of xj with wj, right? And then we pass that all through a logistic function. That's the prediction, which will be a number between zero and one, okay? And then um, for each non-zero feature, basically, you know, if I haven't assigned a weight to that feature yet, we've got to start it off somewhere. So for a logistic regression, it turns out you can easily show it's a convex problem. It will um, uh, converge regardless of what the starting point is. Convenient starting point is just to set all the weights to zero. Um, so we'll just set my weight to some initial value of zero, right? And um, uh, so that's the initial value. And then after I've done that, uh, I'll just update it. Okay, so I'll just increment it by this little uh, uh, delta. Okay, and when I'm done, you know, that hash table matches um, words J to weights, and that's my classifier. Okay. So that's the algorithm, very simple. We're gonna like take a couple, one, well, we're gonna take one more sort of substantive step here. Okay, so logistic regression actually works pretty well, and back in the 90s and maybe early 2000s, people in the NLP community sort of discovered this algorithm, um, and there was a lot of work with it. So one thing you always had to do when you were doing experiments with logistic regression back in the old days is you had to fiddle around with a set of features. So we knew that if you had sparse features, it would overfit, okay? So you had features that didn't occur very, very often, it would overfit. So why does it do that? Well, here's an example of why it does that. Um, so let's think about the batch gradient, okay? So I just gave you the gradient for one example. Um, so, uh, um, so I'll now, you know, just tell you what the gradient would be if I was doing it over a large set of examples, right? And, well, I just summed the gradient over each of the examples, right? Okay, or if we like, we can look at the average. So for this case, you know, because the learning rate is just gonna be multiplied by that at the end of the day, so we might as well look at the average. All right, so the gradient of the, full, the whole data set, we could think of this average as this average here. And we can actually write this out a slightly different way, okay? Um, so uh, I'm basically going to take this sum right here, okay? So here I'm multiplying by, X, by the um, jth component of xi. Let's assume that xi is either one or zero. Okay, so it's just a binary feature. So if it's a binary feature, then um, I can break it down like this. So the cases where that feature is zero don't really matter. So I can just sum it up over the um, cases where the j feature of xi is one, right? So I'm summing up over all the i's and, and uh, I'm just doing this for j here, right? So, uh, so I can just look at the ones where it's one and I can also break that into these two pieces. I can look at the yi's and the pi's. All right, <clears throat> so this sort of seems like a mindless thing to do, right? Why, why am I doing that transformation? Because it actually tells us something, okay? So this quantity right here has a meaning, right? So um, what this is is the average value of yi for all the cases in the data set where xi is one. So let's imagine, um, you know, yi is one if it's about sports and zero if it's not, okay? And xi is the word hockey, right? Um, so if it's the case, whenever you see the word hockey, yi is one, so hockey is almost always in a sports story, then this number will be pretty high, okay? Right, if it, the word is, I don't know, aardvark, and there is no aardvark hockey team, okay? Then um, whenever we see the word aardvark, then yi is likely to be zero, so there'll be a low number. So this is basically the probability of the positive class given that feature value, okay? And it's the probability according to the data, right? So it's the empirical probability of that class being positive given that the feature is positive, okay? Given that the feature is on. And this is the other thing, okay? So this is not the actual probability, but in the data, it's your estimated probability, right? So this is the average predicted that prediction for the, um, cases um, where that word is present, all right? 
So this is basically, what this is basically saying is the gradient is the difference of these things. All right? So the gradient is zero when these things match. The gradient is zero when the average um, predicted probability given a feature is the same as the average probability given that feature. Okay? So this is just an insight into what the gradient is doing. It's not surprising that it does that. That's a very sensible thing to do. Right? Um, uh, so you can use that and construct your own optimization algorithm, which people have done. It's called iterative scaling. Um, or you can just use this to sort of get some insight into what's going on. So one insight you get is if you have a very sparse feature, then these sums are going to be pretty small. Okay? Um, and um, we can ask a question. I mean, suppose you did have like a rare term, let's say aardvark. It only appears a few times, but maybe it, it just by chance it's always in the sports features or maybe always in the non-sports examples, right? So um, let's just assume that just by chance we have a, a sparse feature. And of course, there are lots and lots of sparse features. There are lots of rare words. So there'll be a few of those that only occur in one class, OK? So to get these guys to match, right, if yi is 1, well, I'm actually never going to get pi to be 1, right? It asymptotes at 1, but it's never going to quite get there, right? And, and similarly, if yi is 0, I'm never going to get pi all the way down to 0, right? So the gradient will never be 0 if the features just sort of happen to be sort of perfectly correlated with the class. And that's sort of an extreme case. But in general, what happens when you um, run this vanilla version of logistic regression is that um, you will uh, end up overfitting, specifically for the rare features, right? So um, what people did in the old days is they would um, you know, kind of carefully throw away you know, sparse features to some degree. Um, so, um, so that's a problem, OK? So this is a very simple update. It has an overfitting problem. Uh, and there are ways of getting around that overfitting problem. Uh, the one that's most common um, is, uh, and, and, and this is just showing you Right, this will sort of asymptotically get to um, 1, but it will never quite get there. So there will always be some positive gradient. You'll never exactly converge. All right, so the common approach to fixing this is something called regularization. All right, so that's the next topic. OK. So regularization. Here, yeah. Which now? What do we want to store in a matrix? What, what's the question? Yes. Uh, so do we store the whole vocabulary as a matrix? So that would be one way of doing it, right? If I was going to do this in MATLAB, what I would probably do is I would probably um, uh, convert um, each word into a numeric code. Then I have a sparse matrix, okay, which has all the data, all the xi. So each row is an xi vector, and it would be a sparse vector. Right, and I have another you know, dense column for the y's. Right? So um, in this class, the assignments are basically we're not mapping all the documents into you know, um, numeric codes first. We're just taking, them, uh, we're just taking every word as a string. Okay? Um, so, so here, you'd have to do something more or less what I said here. So j is a string, and we've got a hash table for the string, and that's how we're storing the weights. So that's how we're going to do it for a little bit, but we're going to get away from that pretty soon. Okay, so for now it's a hash table, just like it was for naive Bayes. Okay. Um, all right. So the trick is, uh, is to do regularization. Um, so here's the basic idea. Um, we add some. This is the log conditional likelihood, um, the log probability of, of y equals y given x. Um, uh, and we're going to add basically a penalty. So we're going to basically say, well, if your goal, if this algorithm um, wants to put really large weights on um, uh, rare features, then I'm just going to tell it not to. And I'll tell it not to by basically adding something to the function I'm optimizing. I'm going to add a penalty for really large weights. And um, one that's convenient is to basically look at the sum of squares of all the um, weights. Um, and um, usually put some little factor, a little fudge factor. So mu is the regularization constant. So that's going to tell you how much of a penalty you want to have. Um, and um, uh, so um, when we um, 
compute the um, derivative so we can optimize, uh, then uh, this squared formulation is really nice, be nice because it just you know, turns into like this linear update. So when I differentiate that, right, and this is just the sum of these two components, right? It's the log additional likelihood for that example plus the weights. Um, so I'll end up with this, okay? So I'll end up with this update. There's the original update that I had, and there's this quantity right here. So it's minus two times mu, and the two is just coming because I had a square here, um, times, times wj, all right? So uh, that's the change in the update. Um, uh, just blow it up a little bit so you can see it a little bit better. Um, and uh, it actually, again, this is sort of like kind of a plausible, like intuitive thing to do, right? So what is this basically saying? It says, well, you know, if you've got a large weight, then I, you know, a high positive weight, something that's very positive, then there's a tendency to just push it down. All right, you'll decrease it by something which is proportional to the size of that weight. If it's a very negative weight, then you'll push it up towards zero. Okay, so either way, you're pushing it a little bit towards zero. Okay, um, and if you vectorize it, um, uh, then we'll get something different. So let's see what happens if I take my old algorithm, the old algorithm with this, all right? So this was the update I'm doing. It just depends on x and w. All right, I can only do, I only need to do it for the non-zero entries, all right? So now the update is a little bit different, okay? So now I'm changing this so it's, it's this old um, quantity which depends on xj and also this other quantity which depends on wj, all right? So that's actually a real bummer, okay? It's not very different. If we're doing this on a small data set, um, it doesn't really matter too much. But the thing that's different is here is this update is no longer zero when xj is zero, okay? This update will still be non-zero if, if xj is zero. So I can't just loop through the non-zero features. I've got to zoop, loop through all the features, okay? All right, so the time changes a lot, okay? So if v is the number of features, okay, and you know, n is the number of non-zero entries, before basically what I was doing was just depended on the number of non-zero entries in the data set. So when I made one pass through, I'm only looking at the non-zero entries, okay? Now it's turned into the number of non-zero entries times the size of the vocabulary, because I've got to do this for every feature, all right? So if my documents are, let's say, a thousand word long, a thousand word long, and I have a hundred thousand words in my vocabulary, things have just gotten a hundred times slower, all right? So, so that's a problem, okay? We've lost the ability to do these sparse updates. Um, and, um, you know, again, we can kind of like work out what the example, uh, what, the, um, what the numbers are, but if we have something like um, a couple of million features, right? So one of the data sets we've used in this class in the past is um, um, Wikipedia page classification where you use all the inlinks as features. Um, so if you're using all the links features, there are about two million links. Okay, so the vocabulary is about two million. It's a big vocabulary. Uh, so that would be about 100, that would be 10,000 times slower. Okay, so to make this scalable, we got to get back to sparsity somehow. All right, so this is now the next topic. All right, if you're like the goldfish in the slide, a couple of things back, it's like, oh, God. Logistic regression, again, I've, I've seen this so many times. All right. This is where you should wake up, because this is probably not something you've seen before. Um, uh, <clears throat> so here's the basic idea. Here's my update, okay? And here's an algorithm, right? I, do, I figure out what the prediction is. I go through every feature. This is the slow algorithm, right? Um, I'm just gonna break this up into two pieces, right? So for all the features, I have to do this, this, this update, um, which sometimes this is called a weight decay update, right? or sometimes I might call it like the regularization part of the update, right? So this is the part of the, com the update which is applied to every feature, and it's applied to every feature because you're trying to make those features close to zero, all right? So you have to do that for every feature, and then for the ones that the examples are non-zero, you've got this other update, okay? So this is one way of writing this down, okay? Um, here's um, a slight variation of this. I'm basically going to say, instead of doing this additive update, I'm going to do a multiplicative update here, okay? Works out to be the same, all right? So, uh, um, 
um, decreasing wj by this quantity, so we could just multiply it by 1 minus 2 mu instead. Okay. All right. So, um, so the key idea is I'm going to take this, and what I'm going to do is rather than do this every time, I, for every feature, every time I see an example, what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep track of the last time I applied this part of the regularization, this weight decay regularization. Right? I'm going to find out, I'm going to keep track of how long it's been since that feature has been um, uh, regularized. Right? And whenever I see a feature, I'm going to basically uh, simulate what I would have done in the old dense algorithm. All right? So in the old dense algorithm, there would have been A examples where that feature wasn't used. I didn't see that feature, and so it wasn't, didn't get its weight decay update. All right? But I'm going to keep track of that. I'm going to keep track of the number of examples since we've seen that. Right? And when I see a non-zero feature, then I'll do that decay. All right? And I can do that in closed form. Right? So it's just, it just raising this thing to a power, multiplying by that raised to a power. OK? So, uh, so that's the whole idea, really. All right? Now there's just a little bit of extra bookkeeping that I'm going to do. OK? I'm going to keep track of basically you know, a timestamp. So I've got a clock, K. Right? Whenever I see an example, I'm going to update that clock. OK? And um, I'm going to store the clock cycle that the clock value that I had last time each feature was um, active in an example. All right. So, um, so <coughs> basically, whenever a feature is present in an example, I'm going to reset that AJ to the current clock cycle. All right. The next time I see that feature, I will look and quickly estimate, figure out how long, how many examples have gone by, how many clock cycles have ticked through since the last time that feature was active. So this could be a really small number. If I've seen it very recently, it could be a really big number if I haven't seen it for a while. All right. But whatever the number is, I'm going to apply that much weight decay. So I'm going to simulate the weight decay that I would have done for that, that feature. Okay. Um, and uh, that's really all there is to it, right? So K is this clock reading, OK? AJ is the reading the last time the feature was active. So now I've got more memory. I've got twice as much memory. I've got to keep the weight for each feature. I also have to keep this clock cycle, all right? Um, and we're going to do this weight decay in a lazy way, OK? So um, we're going to um, uh, decay it all in one shot when it becomes um, active. So that's the idea. Um, let me just kind of point out a couple of subtleties here. Um, so I guess the first thing is, right, we've, we've lost a little bit of memory, but the time has gotten back to basically um, uh, order uh, n times the number of cycles, right? So memory use has doubled, but I'm only accessing, I'm only updating, I'm only doing anything with features when they're active. Okay, so all these things are just for the active features. Okay. Um, and again, this is actually a pretty common sort of design pattern when you're working with big data. So our update involves something that's sparse and something that's dense. Okay, so the sparse is the empirical loss, and the dense is the regularization loss. Okay, and what we're focusing on here, because it's the bottleneck in the computation, is the dense part of the update. Okay, right? So, so this, is, this is what we've done here. Okay. Um, so uh, this is one particular instance of this trick. Um, I'll probably talk about one or two others um, as we go over. But um, you can do this um, in a number, number of different settings. It's not always the case that when you do the lazy update, it works out to be quite so nice. It might not be you know, a symbol, single mathematical expression. It might be something you have to do in a loop. Um, but um, you can do this for other gradients. Um, you can do it for. Um, other kind of state-of-the-art streaming algorithms, so follow the regularized leader or something where you can do this for. Um, later on, we'll be talking about perceptrons and voted perceptrons. You can use it for average perceptrons. Um, so there, there, are lots of, there are lots of tricks um, that you can do here. Let me also kind of point out here. So this is a slight oversimplification of what you actually need to do. OK? So um, the tricky part here is that this prediction 
actually depends on the feature weights. Okay, so this is, I printed it this way for pedagogical reasons, I want it to be really clear, right? But in fact, it's a little bit more complicated, right? You gotta through the, go through the features twice. Once to do the regularization updates, right? Then you can do the prediction, okay? Because the prediction is really based on the weights you would have had when you started that, which would include all the regularization updates that you kind of missed out on because you weren't, you weren't doing this lazily. And then after you've done the prediction, then you can do these other updates, which depend on the prediction. So it's a little more subtle than I, I gave you here, but, but not too much. Um, okay. <clears throat> so that's another topic. Um, uh, efficient regularized, um, uh, L2 regularized logistic regression. So that's kind of a trick for that. So I'm now gonna give you one more trick, which makes this algorithm a lot faster. Okay, so here's a little bit of a quiz. Okay, so um, which of these statements are true? When you're doing cl text classification, most of the features, most of the words you encounter are rare. True or false? Okay, um, not correlated with any class. True or false? False? Well, let's say not strongly correlated with any class. True? Okay. Um, have low weights in the linear regression classifier. This isn't really fair because you haven't played with this classifier yet. But if you kind of think about what's going to happen if you have a rare feature. Every once in a while it's going to get updated when it appears in an example, right? And then the rest of the time when it doesn't appear, it's going to be decayed like crazy. Right, so you'll always be multiplying its weight by some this little number, one minus two mu, right? So you're, you're gonna get it, make it smaller and smaller. So this answer is, is also true, right? Um, so the last part is most of the words, is it true they're actually unlikely to affect classification, right? So most of the time you're spending on these words and most of the words don't actually matter. I mean, they have low weights. They're not strongly correlated. They don't come up very often, right? So in some sense, they're not, most of the words really aren't all that interesting, okay? So let's ramp it up a little bit. So supposing I, instead of just using words, I use a much bigger feature space. Supposing I look at bigrams and trigrams, right? So again, most of those n-grams are gonna be very rare, all right? Most of them are not gonna be correlated very well with any class, it's just, now it's even more true that there are gonna be lots and lots of things that have very small weights. So collectively, these things all matter, right? You can't just throw away all the rare words and expect to get the same level of performance, okay? But most of the weights in the classifier are actually gonna be not very important, right? There's gonna be a lot, a lot of weights that are gonna be very small, all right? And they're not gonna affect individual classification decisions very much, all right? So from the point of view of big data, one question is how can we exploit this? All right, so here's one weird idea, okay? So I'm not really saying this is a good idea, this is just sort of a lead into the real idea, okay? But well, one thing we could do is just to reduce the size of my vocabulary, what I'll do is I'll pick random pairs of words and I'll combine them. So I'm gonna combine humanitarian, uh, humanit uh, easy for me to say, humanitarianism and biopsy, all right? So those are two distinct features in my documents and whenever I see one of the, or those two words, I'm gonna replace it with a new word which means basically humanitarianism or biopsy, okay? Or, you know, here's another pair, schizoid or duchy. These are just random words. I just did like a random choice out of user dict, okay? That one's not, that was, I was trying to be funny, I guess. Um, so if I did this for naive Bayes, I mean, naive Bayes, you're already kind of on shaky ground with the independence assumption. But here, we're clearly, things are clearly not independent. Right, because I've, if I randomly combine schizoid and duchy and then I randomly combine you know, duchy and gynecologist, then those two compound terms are certainly not independent, right? Um, but you know, logistic regression, it's basically, we haven't made an independence assumption. Instead, we've assumed a functional form, right? And we're optimizing relative to that functional form. So it's not obvious that it breaks anything for logistic regression. So, when I pick two words to combine, what are the cases? So 
like I said, most of the ter we words have pretty low weight. So most of the time if I pick two random words, they're going to be rare words that don't have a high weight, okay? And it's not going to matter very much. I've added a little bit of noise, but you know, not, not in any sort of important way. Another possibility is I picked a high weight word and a low weight word, and I put them together. And it's, again, that's not going to change things very much, right? The high weight word will sort of dominate. I've added a little bit of noise to that, so what? Okay. Now, it could be the case that, you know, I'm looking at, you know, documents about charity and I'm trying to separate them from, you know, documents about cancer, right? So humanitarianism is a really important feature in my classifier and so is biopsy. I combine them together and I lose some important ability to separate those two classes, right? So it could be that I really hurt myself, okay, if I combine two high weight words. But on the other hand, if I choose two words at random, you know, and most of the weights are small, that's not very likely to happen, right? So the question is, how much of this can I get away with, okay? So certainly I can do it a little bit, right? Um, can I do enough of this to really make a difference, all right? So I'm going to argue that I actually can, and this kind of goes down to another question, right? So your question is, how do I represent this? Sparse matrix, what have you, right? So I said, let's think about a hash table, all right? So a hash table is really not a very um, compact way of storing parameter values, all right? So for that hash code for humanitarianism, I've got to keep that string around, okay? So the, the, the hash table entry has to have that key because when I hash something to the same value, I have to make sure that it's actually, you know, either the same as humanitarianism or it's not, so you know, I have to deal with the collisions. So in the hash table, I have to store all the keys for all the values, all right? That's a lot of space. Now, it's very convenient um, if I'm going to take my words, if, uh, if I have to recode them into like some numeric space, right? That leads to all sorts of like complicated questions. Where does the code mapping from words to um, uh, numeric entries live? How do, what do I do if I get something out of vocabulary and so on and so forth? So it's, it's something convenient about using these hash tables. Okay, but we're, we're paying a lot um, for the hash tables as opposed to just using some sort of numeric code. All right, and what I just argued here is maybe we don't really care about collisions. Okay, so if I let schizoid and duchy collide in the hash table, right, that's basically the same thing as replacing all occurrences of schizoid and duchy with some, you know, new feature which is present for both of them. Right, so collisions in the hash table basically will do this same thing. It'll be as if you've combined two random words. All right. So just following this out, let's imagine now that I do this with it's still a hash table, but it's not really a hash table anymore. It's really just a hash. Okay. So here's my algorithm. All right. Um, uh, so I've got two hash tables. I'm going to call them hash tables W and A. Right. And uh, I go through and I update them. Um, uh, as, as I did before, okay? All right, so now I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna basically take these hash tables and replace them with something simpler, right? So W and A will just be arrays of some fixed size. You know, so maybe R is, you know, 10 million, okay? It's some number which is, you know, big enough to keep most of the vocabulary, all right? Um, and whenever I want to, um, to uh, look at an, an example, all right? I've got the set of strings for that example, right? I've got all the um, uh, um, values that, um, the, all the strings that have a non-zero value, okay? Um, uh, what I'm basically gonna do is I'm going to um, count up all those values and uh, record the total hash quantities, but ignoring collisions, all right? So that's what this quantity basically says, all right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hash um, that string x sub i sub j. So that's a word, so that's like duchy, okay, or aardvark, all right? I'm going to hash that number. I'll, I'll modulo r, so I get a number between 0 and r minus 1, inclusive, okay, right? Um, and... Uh, uh, I'm basically going to sum up the value of xi, 
which will be either, let's say, you know, 0 or 1, or maybe it's like a TF or IDF or something like this. So this is a hash table, all right? So each hash value that I get, all right, is produced by hashing a particular word, but I might end up with some collisions in this. So there's not a one-to-one -one mapping between the words and the, um, in the example and the non-zero entries in this hash table V, right? And so that's a many-to-one mapping, okay? So I've taken the words and I've hashed them uh, into this space of integers, okay? Now I'm gonna basically go through here again. I'm gonna look at the non-zero keys, right? So there's only a few of my large space of possible hash slots that are greater than zero, all right? I'm gonna do exactly the same thing, right? For each of these things that are non-zero, I'll do a decay and I'll do the non-decay, you know, the, the, um, the log conditional likelihood update. Um, and um, that's basically the new algorithm, okay? So um, essentially, um, I have replaced the actual hash tables W and A with these two arrays, okay? To get at a value in the array, I just sort of jump to a value, all right? The way I get that value is by hashing the string and then taking a modulo, right? And I'm not caring about collisions, okay? If two strings hash the same thing, it just, so be it, right? That's as if I just had one feature that was present whenever either of those two strings was present, okay? So, um, uh, and, and as I said, you've gotta be careful about this when we compute the um, prediction as well. All right, um, so let's, let's kind of drill into this a little bit more. All right, so in the actual implementation, we'll have to apply weight decay to features before we compute the prediction. There's one other place where we have to apply weight decay, lazy weight decay. When, I say, when, I'm, when I'm done with learning and I need to save the classifier, then I've got to make sure that I've properly decayed all the features. If I want this to be exactly the same algorithm as the regular dense um, uh, regularized logistic regression, then I've got to make sure that when I'm done, okay, I'm not going to see any more examples. I'm just going to write the classifier out. I still need to do the appropriate decay, right? I have to basically go through and decay everything for all the examples that happened since the last time that example was updated. Um, so here's a possible way of doing this, um, sort of a little API. So I've got one, func one function that will um, uh, predict so I've got a set of features, okay? Um, if this was like in Java, we might have a map that matches strings, let's say, to, um, to doubles, all right? Um, so um, when I do a predict, then I'm gonna apply the weight decay using um, my A, my array A, okay? And um, uh, uh, then uh, figure out what the prediction is. When I regularize, okay? <laughs> Um, oh, let's see. Yeah, let's see. So predicts predict during the weight, predicts using the current weights, okay. Regularize is gonna basically catch up. It's gonna basically do the um, weight decay um, uh, using the timestamp for that feature in A, right, and using the current clock cycle K, right. Um, I'm gonna do save, right, and when I save again, I've gotta know when I'm saving it So because I've gotta regularize all the features, okay. Um, uh, we need to be able to load a classifier in, obviously, if we want to do training and testing. And when I train on one example, I basically need two things. I need the features, okay, I need the true label Y, okay, and I need the clock cycle. So what am I gonna do? I'm gonna go through, I'll regularize every feature and predict and apply the update, okay. Um, so, um, uh, yeah. This one here? Yeah, the, the K? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so that's the current clock cycle, right? So you need the clock cycle so you can regularize things. So this is basically doing the lazy regularization, all the regularization you need to have done on the active features since the last time they were active. So this K will get passed into this thing as current K. Yeah, so the A array in, in, in my implementation is sort of sto stored locally in the classifier, okay, right? So 
the main program for this would basically assume you've got randomly ordered examples, so it can do this um, stochastically. Okay. So you might need some other things. This is actually, um, there's some more specific hints in the um, assignment that's coming out on Thursday um, about this. Um, so, you know, again, like, um, uh, so for every stochastic gradient descent algorithm, uh, there's going to be some parameter tuning involved. This is a fairly simple one, um, and that means it's easy to implement. Um, but you know, uh, since it's also since it's, it's not very robust to parameter choices, um, so uh, here's some kind of reasonable values to start with. So I use mu of 0.1, um, and lambda. Um, a kind of standard thing is to decrease lambda over time. So you use a relatively large learning rate early on and then you kind of gradually crank it down. Um, so this is one plausible schedule. It has some nice theoretical properties. In, in practice, it's actually pretty aggressive. Um, uh, but basically, it sort of means that you sort of decrease the learning rate as the square of the number of epochs. Um, uh, and then there'll be some other parameter that uh, is, is uh, used to drive uh, lambda. OK. So um, the next part of this lecture, I was going to describe some uh, empirical results on really large data sets using this technique just to get you guys motivated. But since it's 247, I'm going to stop. Uh, and uh, we'll pick that up on Thursday. Okay? Why yes. should we use uh, J instead of the